Romans chapter 6 is where you'll want to turn as we wrap up today. We'll put some word in you and then let you turn you loose so you can go be a light and a witness. It says, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse number 1 says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Verse number 3, Or do you not know that as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, praise God. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, come on, that's not talking about your dad or your husband, Old man was what? Crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be tossed or be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been what? Freed from sin. Father, we thank you for your word today. Speak to us by your spirit. We know that you will in Jesus' name. So we're picking up where we left off three weeks ago. We've had a little bit of a bumpy ride here because we've had some ins and outs as far as who's ministered and all that good stuff. But usually during the summer, you get a little vacation in. How many enjoy some vacation? All right. So, but we're studying and discussing the subject of sanctification. And we talked about what the definition of sanctification was. This was our first point. Sanctification, this word means to make holy, to purify, or to consecrate, to hallow, or to be holy, to separate from things profane and dedicate to God. Now, I don't want you to try and take notes right now. I just want you to listen. If you want to go back and listen to the other messages, you can get all this information. I'll tell you where I pick up on the new stuff that I'm going to give you today. All right, so this word carries the idea of the removing of our lives from one place or position into another to be used by God for his purpose, kind of like, here I am, Lord, send me, right? We talked about three kinds of sanctification. We talked about positional sanctification. We talked about experiential sanctification. And we talked about ultimate or eternal sanctification. We're emphasizing the middle one, which is experiential Sanctification. The second point that we looked at in this message was defining and showing how we live an experiential, experiential sanctification daily. Finally, we're wrapping up this series with the third point entitled Dead to Sin and Alive to God. And we're looking into the reality of Romans chapter 6. We introduce Romans chapter 6 in an overview, and I just want to hit a couple of the main things. I don't want to read all of it because I want to get into the rest of what we have for today. But some of the thoughts that we brought out concerning Romans chapter 6 is it expresses the fact that grace not only deals with the penalty of sin, but as we will see in this section with its power. So the penalty of sin has been dealt with, but so has the power of sin. Okay? And, the, and it is by that same grace that the power of sin is dealt with through that we call sanctification. The work of God in us producing or increasing the conformity of us into the image of Christ. All right? So, when we think about sanctification, though, or we think about living a sanctified or holy life, there's a temptation to see justification or you're born again as an act or a divine initiative. In other words, God did all the work. And then sanctification as a human endeavor. How many know that you couldn't deliver yourself from sin? You couldn't, you couldn't earn your salvation. Okay? And you can't muscle your sanctification. You say, what do you mean by that? You need grace at the beginning, in the middle. Grace is a must. So grace not only is defined as divine favor. In other words, you're receiving something that you didn't earn. It also carries the idea of an empowerment. All right? It carries the truth that it is an empowerment. So that's why Paul can honestly say, how, have, how can you and I, who have died to sin, live in it any longer? 
That's a powerful statement. Now, how many would say by your hand, you know you're going to heaven when you leave this earth? Now, how many would say by your hand, you know that you can overcome sin in this life? (laughs) Is that because I told you the answer or you really believe it? Because I really, this teaching has challenged my own thinking. I need to actually expect that I will live sanctified rather than expect I woke up today, I'm going to sin today. Because that's what he's saying. That's what Paul's saying right here. I, I understand that we have minds that need renewed in our bodies we're going to look at this, our bodies aren't exactly in line with what they should be right now, right? The fullness of the resurrection of the body hasn't happened yet, right? So we understand that, okay? We understand that principle. But I think, I know in religious thinking, I have overemphasized the flesh and underemphasized the resurrection. I have overemphasized at times, well, (laughs) you know me, I'm just Scottish (laughs) and Norwegian. That means I'm a Viking and William Wallace, which means you're dead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pillage everything in your life if you make me mad. No. It is no longer I who lives. <laughs> I felt joy just go right across me. I, I don't know if it went over you, but it just did. It, it's, it's Christ who lives There's such a revelation of grace that it can come to the point where Paul said this, you're neither male nor female in Christ. He said, it's no longer I. It's Christ who lives in me. And then people, we have this question then. then Why am I still doing the dumb stuff I'm doing? The mind has to be renewed. Well, it starts with faith in the heart that you can overcome. And that faith comes from the instruction of the word then the mind has to be renewed to that thought because it's still a lot of times conditioned to the old way, the old man that died. And then you need to understand the nature of your flesh that it is to be your slave. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, and you live in a body. And your body is what Paul calls or Peter calls a tent. It's just a sheath. If you look up the word in the Greek, it simply is like a sword going into a holster. That's what your body is. Now, you're the sword. The Spirit of God lives in you. You're born again. You've actually already died and come back to life in Christ, in your spirit. So the noodle needs renewed, and the body needs disciplined. Amen? If you're waiting for your body to feel resurrected, stop. If you're waiting for your body to come up with a righteous idea, stop. Amen. That's why we have the written word first. So Paul makes the statement. He says, what shall we say? This is verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may, may abound? He said, certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? The death of the believer to sin means that the domination of sin has been broken. In short, Paul's initial response to the charge that this gospel, that his gospel and this gospel promotes sin, is that grace, instead of encouraging sin, actually provides the means of escape from its fatal grip. I like that. So what do we know? We know then that the desire to live holy, a holy life as a believer, does not come from a place of earning our salvation, but rather from a place of understanding our salvation. The Holy Spirit said this to me when I was in Colorado and I was driving and I believe it is for us as a church. I am not giving you up. I am not giving up on you and your spiritual growth. So you don't give up on you and your spiritual growth. You know what I mean? I understand we make mistakes, but realize this. The Holy Spirit is not the spirit of condemnation. He's the spirit of convincing, conviction, right? He convinces you of who you are in Christ. 
You say, what do you, how do I tell the difference? Very simply. And I need to say it again and again and again and again. If the thoughts are coming to you of conviction, they provide a way out. If thoughts are coming to you of condemnation, then you won't find a way out. You... It, condemning thoughts come from hell hell thoughts confine you to death jesus thoughts convincing thoughts god's thoughts holy ghost thoughts convince you of life and life more abundantly right <laughs> don't allow the devil the devil and and your habitual sins the ones you have a habit in, in the flesh to stop you from receiving forgiveness, repenting, and continuing in resurrection graces until you mature, or I would say, until you overcome. Amen. People say, well, I've already overcome in the Spirit. Love it. That's exactly true. But that doesn't mean it's manifested in the flesh fully. Mark said this this morning. And uh, he, he didn't say it this way, but he referenced that. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're living in the fullness of it. Experiential sanctification is a process of allowing what is in us to transform our thinking and dominate our flesh. Verse number 3, Romans 6. Or do you not know that as, a, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in what? Newness of life. So what is that telling us? That is telling us that God not only took care of our eternity, but he also took care of our now. So that means what? That means that we are empowered to live in newness of life. What is the newness of life? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, I have to say this over and over. Don't get frustrated with the process. Spiritual growth is a lot like natural growth. How many of you have kids that are grown now? How many remember watching them thinking they could do more than they actually could at certain stages and ages? Right? What does a little boy say? He says, I'm big like dad. Right? You know, puffs his chest out. All that good stuff. But can he actually do what dad can do? It's still in seed form. Come on, let that spirit, spiritual elevator go all the way to the top. <laughs> Sometimes you'll read something in the Word and you'll think, that's not me. But it is. It's just in seed form still. But in order for seed form... To become fully matured tree, what needs to take place? Got to be watered, planted, watered, cultivated. You've got to, come on, work from your salvation. Not for it, from it. You got to keep the weeds out. You're progressively stepping into newness of life. His mercies are new so your growth is a, is a, is a, uh, there's a, there's a consistent positive hope for your spiritual development because there are mercies every morning. Come on. And we are engaging faith in the direction of experiential sanctification. We're engaging our minds in the renewal process of the word of God and pointing our expectation toward, I'm not going to lose my temper every time I get cut off in traffic. I'm not going to lose my temper and hate somebody because of the color of their skin. I'm not going to, come on, I'm not going to see it, the battle as me against flesh, but realize that the battle is in the spirit. I don't war with flesh and blood. This isn't about what somebody is presenting to me naturally. There is an influence coming through them that I need to deal with. I don't have to, you know, my husband, <laughs> this is as if a wife was speaking. I do not have a husband. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I had to clarify that, you know, sometimes. This goes on the internet, so, you know. Uh, 
Come on, when you develop spiritually, there's no such thing to the point, if you develop in love like you should, there's no such thing as trigger words. Is the word right or is the word right? The Bible says that the love of God takes no account of a wrong suffered. Well, when, when somebody does this to me, come on, listen to me. I'm prophesying right now. I'm dealing with a spiritual issue. When, when this person does this, I just, I get all this, this stuff just rises up within me. I know, but it's not them doing that. That reminds you of something that actually is seated in your soul. And so what needs to take place? Intimacy with your Savior. And he'll remove that. He'll do surgery in your soul and take it out. When I was in high school, I pre pretended to be tough. It's true. I wasn't really that tough. I pretended to be tough. I thought, well, you know, maybe if I put on a front, which we all pretend things until we're saved anyway, and even afterwards. Well, I... Uh, I, I was in a relationship with a girl at Skyview. And you know when you're in high school, you have Skyview, West, and Senior, at least around here. And just by default, you're supposed to hate the other school. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, when I was, it, it just, it's, it's just crazy the way we think sometimes. The demons are working. And so somebody in this group of friends that I was hanging out with, I don't know, somehow it came about, there was a group up at, at the Skyview High School that decided I was a person who went to this individual, this, this friend of this girl that I was dating, went to their house and keyed his truck. How many know what keying a truck is? You know what that is? Okay. Just make sure. I don't think we've changed that much. That, that isn't still a thing. So they decided I did it. Of course, I didn't do it. So at the time, there was a pretend gang at Skyview. <laughs> Does anybody remember the name? Yeah. It was called the Beer Mafia. Oh. <laughs> I mean, they thought this one through. <laughs> we're the Beer Mafia. Okay. All right. Well, great. So they decided that they were going to beat me up at a West High Skyview basketball game. And there were like 10 of them maybe more, surrounded me. And I, I got caught alone, right? How many know that's scary? <laughs> Especially with the beer mafia. <laughs> after, after you. <laughs> My God, it's a good thing I got saved. All right, so. <laughs> so they threatened me and pushed me and all that stuff. And, you know, they never really did anything. But from then on, I had this fear they're going to be at a game, they're going to be somewhere, they're going to be at a, you know, a party or something that I was going to and I was going to get beat up. So I just started just staying away from certain things, wouldn't go anywhere you know, to a degree with my friends and stuff like that. Well, I, that fear carried over into my Christianity because it was in my thinking, not that my spirit wasn't new, it was. How many know today I don't lose sleep over the beer mafia? <laughs> okay, I, I don't. Now, I know that, that these things are real, that people get together and that they have this activity that goes on, but it doesn't, even if they surrounded me today, I know in whom I have believed. So what I'm saying is, is somebody could have surrounded me, un, you know, maybe they didn't mean any harm to me after I was saved, just newly saved, and I could have all those feelings come up and I could try to make everybody around me conform to how I feel, and make sure they don't do anything that would cause me to feel afraid. How many know that is a pipe dream? That is a, there is no way in this life that everybody is going to do everything they're supposed to do to make me feel comfortable. That's why the spirit of the resurrection is within me. So I have the ability to live in what? Experiential sanctification. What does that mean? That means that for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 
See, now I'm not just motivating you in the sense of getting you excited about that. When the word of God is within you, when it transforms your thinking, you begin to operate in faith from that resurrection within and you're able to dominate you, not other people. You, your body, your thinking, your person. You have no reason to fear because the spirit of resurrection lives inside you. Well, they accused me of something I didn't do. So? Come on, I'm a preacher. I get accused of things I didn't do all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's just true. Right? We, we do. That stuff, ha- people will, will accuse you of wrong motives. Motives, Okay. Have you ever done that insecure thing and tried to prove to everybody it wasn't what they said it was? You, you, can't, you can't make anybody believe anything about you. What can I do? I can walk in love. You can walk in love. You can live in newness. Somebody say newness. Of life. Let's skip down to verse number 6 and 7 and we'll wrap up here. Paul says, knowing this, That our old man, and that's talking about your spirit man, if you're taking notes, was crucified with him. That the body of sin, and you don't have to underline that, but just remember that phrase, body of sin, might be done away with. And what that means is made powerless or made useless. With that we should, so he says, might be done away with, that we should no longer be what? Slaves of sin. Now, If you read this without proper understanding, it can make it look like your spirit has two natures. But notice where the sin is located. The body of sin. Your old man was crucified. Your spirit, that's the old man. That was, Paul said this, if any man be in, he is a, old things have or crucified. The first part of that verse. That the body of sin, where is sin? In the body. Might be what? Done away with, or in the Greek, it actually means made powerless or made useless. So that you might what? No longer be a slave to... Well, I just can't help it. I'm just a slave to that sin. I just can't. What does that say? It says that Christ has empowered you and I to no longer, come on, be a slave to. And people say, then what's my problem? Your noodle and your body. Come on. The gray matter's got to be changed. Right? And then once your mind lines up with your spirit, you can dominate your flesh. Think about this. Jesus dominated his flesh to the point that he could let himself, his body be crucified for us. Now watch. The early disciples understood grace to such a degree that they, they actually longed or were, were passionate about being a martyr for him. How can you do that? Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you, your body feels close to death, it actually resists that bugger, doesn't it? It fights back, right? So how could these men... How could Paul just lay his head down? Because Paul was beheaded, right? According to to church history. All of them were martyred except for John. And they tried to boil him in in oil. But he said, nope, I ain't going that way. So they're like, well, just throw him on an island. Maybe he'll die. How could they live 
such experiential sanctification to the point that they didn't even consider what would happen to their body. They just continued in obedience. What were they not slave to? Why? Because they understood grace. Come on, that grace lives in you. Come on, Christian. I know I'm stretching you. It lives in, he lives in you. You believe that? It's going to have an effect then. It's going to have an effect. So as we deal with this, and we're going to wrap this series up next week. But as we deal with this, realize it's your body wanting to go the direction that it shouldn't. It's your mind, when thoughts come to you or your mind wants to go in a direction that's old man thinking... Okay, thinking on in a sin way, realize that's in the air and realize your mind is a computer and it needs reprogrammed. You say reprogrammed. Yes. We talked about this in the in how we walk this out. Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? How are we are to be what we are to be transformed by the not the removal, the renewal. And you say. Why do you have to say that? Because I'm in spirit-filled churches. I promise you, or there are Pentecostals that have probably removed their mind. I've met them. The Lord told me this. 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 And they are all over the map. The Holy Ghost is not empowering you to be a weirdo. <laughs> or spiritually undisciplined. He is not. It is not the way he operates. <laughs> oh, that was for free. It wasn't even in my notes. I just, I felt it was there. It was just there. All right. <laughs> okay. A couple of verses and then we'll stop. What is the body of sin? And I, I want you to remember this. Or write it down. And you can, if you want to come back and watch this later, we, all, everything's on the website. So you can get that. The body of sin is the flesh, which is, it's talked about in John chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. There's clear scriptures that separate flesh from spirit. What did, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? That which is born of the flesh is, that which is born of the spirit is, spirit. Yep. The old man or the, the, the body of sin is referenced in Ephesians 4.22. It's, uh, uh, it's referenced in Romans 6.6. 6. The flesh, the, the, the body of sin is referenced in Galatians 5.16. And 1 Corinthians 15.50. So the, when, you, when you think about the nature of your flesh, now when you think about the nature of your spirit, don't think in terms of dual nature. People say, what do you mean by that? You do not have sin and Holy Spirit hanging out in your spirit. Jesus is not hanging out with devils and sin in your spirit. You, you've read the Gospels, right? Did demons just love to hang out with Jesus? They screamed for fear, which tells you how big the one is in you and how small the one is against you. (laughs) You know, I read, I like to read old preachers too. Me and Mark have this in common. But I read stuff by Smith Wigglesworth. He'd start out in a service and a demon-possessed person to jump up and scream and start trying to run out, he would run and tackle them. (laughs) Now, that happens in this church. We're going to have riot or revival, one or the other. But (laughs) you understand what I mean? 
He, would, he tackled, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was a guy, maybe it was a lady, I don't, it doesn't matter. It was, they had a demon. Run, tackle him, get on top of him. In the name of Jesus, come out of him. That demon leaves. And he said it was kind of like it, they deflated. Pfft. Why? Because the greater one lives where? In you. So specifically in Romans 6, uh, verse uh, 6, this is the first of many verses describing the location of the flesh. The sin nature is a part of the body. This is why it is called the body of sin. It dwells in our members, according to Romans 7, 5. We can, listen to this carefully, we can render the flesh inoperative by the resurrection grace within us. Until the day our body is dead or redeemed at the rapture of the church. Just like, for those of you that are automotive dudes or dudettes, just like pulling the coil wire from a distributor of a car, the car is rendered inoperative or powerless, but the car is not destroyed. In this way, the flesh is still present but powerless and we do not serve it. So say this with me. Say, because of Christ within me, I can render the body of sin inoperative. Now, you need to remind yourself where the power source is for you to overcome. And I'm going to give you several scriptures at the end, next week, at the end, that are directly connected to uh, referencing this very thing. And the main one is Romans 8.13. We render the body powerless to sin through the Holy Spirit within. Okay? We render the body powerless to sin and the scripture actually says it and we're going to look at it when we look at Romans uh, chapter 6 verse 11 through 14 is where it specifically references it but we're going to see we're going to see that um, we can actually present our bodies our members which is every part of us that isn't born again okay it isn't fully redeemed yet every part of that we can present it as a slave to righteousness. You are empowered to present your tongue as a slave of righteousness. You're empowered to present your mind as a slave to righteousness. You, you are empowered to present your body and the chemical balance of your body not to the need of an outside source to relieve a craving, but you're actually empowered to say, nope, you don't get that anymore. People say, oh yeah, we gotta, we got to pray for those that are heroin addicts. I'm talking to the Mountain Dew addicts. <laughs> well, I just can't go through my day without my morning cup of coffee. I'm just not who I'm supposed to be without that coffee in the morning. I just have a bad attitude all day. Death, 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 death. The power of the resurrection lives within you. Caffeine is nothing compared to Jesus. <laughs> you can be nice to people at work, not because you had your cup of joe but because you have Jesus in you. <laughs> yeah, that gives me joy. Stirs it up on the inside of me. <laughs> he was like, well, you know, if I don't have my oatmeal and my routine every morning, then I'm just in a bad mood. You're just carnal, you little carnal Christian, you. <laughs> Somebody needs to change your poopy diaper because you're stinking everywhere. You're running all around. Come on. Everybody's had that kid. How many of you, it looks like they're testing the weight limit of the diaper. The parents are. You've seen that kid running around, right? 
When, we, when our kids were little, we'd go, to the, we, <laughs> we'd go to the swimming pool or whatever, and some parent would have their kid out there in a diaper that wasn't a swim diaper. And I mean, it, you know, they like the kids counterbalancing, you know what I mean? <laughs> to try... And I mean, at that point, you can't even tell if there's something in the diaper. It just soaked. But there are Christians that live like that. It's like, oh, oh. something smells in the house. You know what I mean? I just. Now, everybody has had that, right? Every believer has had that. But what are we doing? We're growing out of that, right? Because we're empowered to overcome that. Come on. Spiritually, when you mature, you don't need somebody to cut your little sandwiches and little rockets every day. I mean, it's kind of fun, but you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Joy, would you come? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't want to give anybody an opportunity to receive Jesus this morning. <laughs> if you're in this place this morning and you either have never given your heart to Jesus or you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, I want to take this opportunity and have the privilege, if I would, of being able to pray that prayer with you and so you can give your heart to Jesus. Scripture says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, that eternity is planted in our hearts, whether we're born again or not. We know, of course, according to John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he, be, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not out to condemn you. He's out to save you. We know that all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, according to Romans 3, 23. We know that heaven is a free gift, according to Romans 6, 23 and must be received by grace through faith. God really does desire to be in a relationship, back in a relationship with you. That's why he demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We receive God's forgiveness through faith. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, the spirit of man, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You can receive this gift of eternal life right now. So if you haven't given your heart to the Lord or you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, I just simply want you to raise your hand where you're at, and I want to pray with you this morning. Is there anybody in here that would like to do that? Hallelujah. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Yes, I see another hand there. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, praise God. Well, let's pray this together, if we would, church, and help welcome these into the family of God. If you just want to say this after me, say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus who came to this earth and lived a sinless life and died on the cross for our sins. I believe he rose from the dead so I could receive forgiveness, so that I could become a child of God and receive the gift of eternal life. I come to you now and repent of my sin. I receive your gift of forgiveness and I give my life and my heart to you. I believe you have accepted me because Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He also said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you for saving me, making me your child, and helping me live for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah.
you are born again. Now, I want to do this real quick. Uh, one of the things that we do here is we ask that if you did give your heart to the Lord to rededicate it, that you come up and talk with our uh, altar care workers. Um, they have a new believers packet that we want to give you that will help you get started in this. Uh, biggest thing is make sure you're here with us because we want to help you. So anytime there's a service or an event, just be a part of it. Become a part of the family. You know, sometimes people think, well, I don't know very many people. Well, you're never going to know very many if you don't come back. But I promise you this church will love you. And they'll bring you in. And uh, there's a card inside that uh, New Believers packet. And there are six messages that we have on our website that I'd like you to begin to listen to. It gives you all the instruction on how and what to listen to. If there's anybody online that gave your heart to the Lord during that, same goes for you. Please contact us via Facebook, and we'll get you all the information, including the Bible and everything that's in the packet. And we'll be able to help you get on your way in your relationship with the Lord. If you're not in Billings, we'll help you find a good church where you're at.